London was smoking all my dragons. Devon Righteous, almighty greats, overachieving, never slacking. We flying over to London today. And this video is called London, the Empire Mega City. Always been interested in London. London just always reminded me of New York, to be honest. Always reminded me of home. So, yeah, we're going to hop right into it. Original link in the description. Let's get to it. London, here we go. The world's largest city, until 1925, is now a mature, well-planned metropolis with a population of... What city took uh, took it after that? What city took it? I want to know. After 1925. 13.7 million. It's a highly admired place and is consistently ranked as a top three most visited destination on the planet, making its airspace the busiest on Earth. As the largest urban economy in Europe, with the greatest concentration of top-class universities, it has hosted the Summer Olympics a record three times. It has something for everyone, whether you're after luxury, the world's most five-star hotels, nature, the world's largest urban forest in a city with more than 40% green space, sports, the world's highest total stadium capacity, or entertainment, the world's biggest theater audience. But while the high life continues for many, this city has seen its share of tough times. This is London, the Empire City. Londinium was founded in 43 AD along the River Thames as a gateway for goods and people entering Britannia from every corner of the Roman Empire. A walled city covering roughly 1.5 square kilometers Roman London reached a population of 60,000 in the second century. But the empire soon came under severe crisis, and by the fourth century, Londinium was completely abandoned. After 700 years, what was now called London had recovered to become the largest town in England. The construction of Westminster Abbey in the 11th century ensured its place as the heart of the country. Since then, the Abbey has hosted every coronation of an English or British monarch. Its most recent royal wedding was Prince William to Catherine Middleton. And last month, the state funeral of Elizabeth II. Hold on, guys. It's so weird. My camera's like doing dance moves here. Like, that's weird. So you would think it's like a ghost or something touching it. It just keeps moving on its own. Took place at the Abbey. Sitting alongside is the Palace of Westminster home to the government of the United Kingdom with its two houses of parliament. Westminster lies just southwest of the city of London, a ceremonial district that covers a bit more than a square mile. It constituted most of settled London through the Middle Ages and is today one of the world's most important financial centers. The Royal Exchange, seen here with work being done to its facade, was the center of London commerce. Originally opened by Queen Elizabeth I, Royal heralds still shout the news of historic events from its steps, like the dissolution of Parliament and the start of a new monarch's reign. Three cheers for His Majesty the King. Hip hip! Hooray! Just outside the city's borders is the Tower of London. Originally a castle built by King William the Conqueror, it has served as a grand royal palace, a prison, a treasury, a menagerie, the royal mint, a public record office, and the home of the crown jewels of England. In the 1660s, it was an armory, during the most destructive event in London's history. Still reeling from the Great Plague that year that had killed 100,000 people, nearly a quarter of its population, Londoners awoke on the morning of September 2nd, 1666, to high winds and smoke. Over four days, most of the medieval city was destroyed by a raging fire. The Tower of London garrison used gunpowder to create effective firebreaks that stopped the fire's spread to the east. Although there's never been an official death toll, several thousand were likely killed, and thousands of buildings were reduced to ash, including over 13,000 homes, 90 churches, and St. Paul's Cathedral. In the aftermath, many architects submitted plans reimagining grand boulevards along a grid system that would become popular in urban America. But the businessmen of the city were eager to rebuild and mostly stuck to the old street plan, although they widened some streets and built with brick and stone rather than flammable wood. 
Even without an extensive redesign, the cost of the rebuild forced the City of London Corporation into default and forced thousands of its newly homeless residents to resettle in the countryside, with a little push from King Charles II who feared they might revolt. So how did London survive a devastating plague and fire in the same year? There's a chance the most powerful person in the world is watching this broadcast. I really hope history is so important. So important to know. The simplest explanation is that the culture of the city at this time was historically dynamic, cultivating ingenuity in every aspect of society. London's population had recently exploded leading up to the Great Plague and Fire, growing from 50,000 to 500,000. As the main port in the North Sea, its ships were taking full advantage of new trading opportunities in the Americas and Asia. And one new commodity they brought back gave Londoners a huge jolt. Coffee. The foreign brew was served in houses that became meeting places to catch up on and debate the news of the day. Soon, houses catered to particular trades like craftsmen, writers, and explorers. The free exchange of ideas they encouraged gave rise to the UK's National Academy of Sciences, whose members included the coffeehouse addicted Robert Hooke, the great Isaac Newton, chemist Robert Boyle, philosopher John Locke, and prolific architect Christopher Wren. Coffeehouse culture also fueled the world's first great capitalist economy. Edward Lloyd's house specialized in obtaining the most reliable shipping news. A waiter there would read out the latest bulletins, then pin them to a wall, attracting long-distance traders eager to make deals on site. Today, Lloyd's has evolved into the world's main insurance market, an unseen but vital engine in the globalized economy, where brokers and underwriters can still meet face-to-face -to, -face to form the trust necessary to close deals that are too risky or unique for any other market. This culture also established in 1694 the Bank of England, creating a publicly financed national debt, an innovation that positioned Britain as a global superpower and its capital as the world's most important city of the 1700s. London's wealth allowed it to finance the most powerful navy the world had ever seen. The memorial column at Trafalgar Square commemorates the victory that cemented Britain's superiority on the high seas. The battle saw an outnumbered Admiral Horatio Nelson bravely sacrifice his life while leading his warships into the heart of the combined Spanish and French fleets, decimating them without losing a single British vessel. The victory ended any hope European conquerors like Napoleon had for invading Britain by sea, and set the stage for a peacetime boom. Propelled by inventions like the electric motor by London's Michael Faraday, the Industrial Revolution brought rapid urbanization and growth, and by 1831, London was the largest city in the world. It was also filthy. The Thames was an open sewer, capturing the waste of three million people. The stink and cholera it produced was unbearable. See, this is when I picture like Oliver Twist, orphans running around, stealing out of people's pockets. Like that's, that's what I picture right now uh, in the times that they're talking about where it was just filthy and it's just crazy how it could be like there's a superpower that's so wealthy but at the same time be filthy ain't that something y'all bearable chief civil engineer joseph bazalgette was put in charge of creating a modern sewer system an innovative mega project involving hundreds of miles of brick and cement tunnels combined with several pumping stations to move the sewage a few miles down river release it safely away from London. Another engineering marvel at this time was the underground. Through trial and error over 20 grueling years, project mastermind John Fowler's team perfected the technique of cut and cover, completing the Metropolitan Line in 1863. It was both the world's first subterranean and rapid railway system. Today it is the third longest metro system on earth, and is still growing. The 19 billion pound Elizabeth Line was inaugurated this May, completing a phase that was the biggest construction project in all of Europe. The quality of transportation available to Londoners, including their roads and stagecoach service, allowed them to settle and commute farther from the city centre. With the population passing 6 million in the 1800s, middle class workers were looking for homes with a modest garden. 
So developers built sprawling tracts in the outskirts, including the Beacon Tree Estate in Dagenham. With more than 25,000 semi-detached dwellings, it was the largest housing development in the world. It seems suburbia began in Britain, foreshadowing the sprawl that was to come to places like Los Angeles. Okay. Wow, so London was really like the blueprint for so many uh, other places. That's crazy. That's crazy. London's history is so just deep. Such deep history. And people always like, there's a lot of people that try to like make fun of London, but nah. London has a lot to to learn, you know, to learn from and awful and also to offer. But people wouldn't know if they're not willing to look. I'm speaking to my American people now, you know, that may may uh look down on London for whatever reason just because they sound different. There's a lot of ignorant people out here. It's patching. As London swallowed up more and more of the surrounding... And that's crazy because I could see it. You know, L.A. is very spread out. I've been to L.A. Very spread out. Like, you could just... You could see how it was set up that way. New York, we're more... It's more... It's congested. <laughs> like, everything's just pushed together. But L.A., definitely, you could just see that. ...in countryside. Authorities contained it by reserving wide swaths of land for a green belt seven to ten miles deep around its built-up area. This so-called girdle could only be left wild, turned into parks, or used for agriculture, an idea sold to Londoners as guaranteeing their access to recreation. The citizens of Britain's other cities wanted access to clean air and nature too, and soon were adopting green belts of their own. In 1941, after Hitler's Air Force bombed London for eight months, killing more than 30,000, many buildings were destroyed. However, with the Green Belt restricting development, the cost of the land... Eight months, they was not playing. That was hell on earth. ...land available to build on rose. A trend that has continued until today, when 70% of the cost of a new building is now the purchase of the land, compared to just 25% in the 1950s. This has contributed to a severe shortage of affordable housing, and sparked a much-needed conversation about how to more wisely use London's precious public lands in ways that actually benefit the general public. Another post-war development was an increase in immigration to London from the British Commonwealth countries of India, Jamaica, and Pakistan. Today, more than 4 million Londoners are foreign-born, the fourth largest immigrant community in the world after New York, LA, and Paris. But drawing so many new arrivals has contributed to London's housing crunch, and the megacity now has the highest real estate prices in Europe. So developers try to stack more square footage on each plot of land, making buildings taller and changing London- Yeah, I can still see that with LA now, now that they said that. It's like, even looking from right here, it reminds me of LA so much. Whew. But I can see it with the immigrants. Uh, Having so much immigrants too, just because even when I listen to like music artists from there, there's so much like Somalians and you know just different Africans, period, and different people from around the world that uh, definitely live in London. They definitely have a lot, like a lot of a lot of the the people there, parents of immigrants or immigrants themselves. So um, yeah, I definitely see that. It's, it's, like I said, it reminds me of New York a lot. Now L.A. now now with the spread outness, but. Still, you know, it's, it's, it shows it, um, it influenced everywhere else, you know, because once again, going to New York, you know, you go to places like Brooklyn and this and that, and everything's kind of just the streets. Even when I look at this, um, certain streets remind me of, of Soho, you know, Soho, New York City. It's like, I'm looking right at it. London's notoriously low slung skyline. The financial districts are home to most of the 103 buildings taller than 100 meters, the second to most skyscrapers in Europe behind Moscow. As a picturesque riverine city with layers of historic architecture, gorgeous greenscapes, an economy that hums along as the capital of one of the world's most stable democracies, it's no wonder why people and their money are drawn to London. However, the twin challenges of assimilating millions of foreigners and adapting to the rising cost of living, especially for those outside the capital, 
helped sway a majority of British voters to leave the European Union in the summer of 2016, a decision that continues to challenge the churn of occupants at 10 Downing Street, the Prime Minister's residence. Just across from St. James Park is Buckingham Palace, official residence of the Head of State of the United Kingdom, the newly crowned King Charles III. While both Brexit and the role of a monarch in a modern society pose internal political challenges for the entire country, London is also grappling with the wicked problem facing the entire world, climate change. During the record heat wave this July that saw temperatures reach 40.2 Celsius or 104.4 Fahrenheit at Heathrow Airport, numerous parts of London were again ablaze. Jeez. To the east, the steadily rising sea presents an enormous flood risk to an estimated 200 billion pounds worth of property along the Thames, a tidal river. To protect the city, an impressive 520 meter retractable barrier was built in 1984, a structure the Environmental Agency believes should last with slight modifications until 2070, a testament to the foresight of its design and engineering team. Water also presents another challenge. While London is sometimes perceived as consistently socked in by fog and grey skies, it actually receives just half the rainfall of New York City, despite a significantly more northern latitude. It even gets less rain than the fairly dry cities of Rome, Lisbon, and Sydney. The problem is that the western half of southern England catches most of the rain systems from the Atlantic, receiving about four times the precipitation as the eastern half. As things continue to get drier and more unpredictable, hydrologists warn that London, on the eastern, dry side, may begin having water supply problems by 2050. So a debate is ongoing about whether to submerge a swath of Oxfordshire on the Thames to create a reservoir to store water for the megacity. But although London faces a few challenges from forces beyond its control, solving them seems relatively straightforward. And looking ahead, London's position, well away from the coast, on a temperate island with no active volcanoes, is one of the most advantageous locations for any major city in history, which should allow it to continue as a top global city well into the 2100s. If you enjoyed this episode, check out my look at Jakarta, Indonesia's megacity, whose citizens... Whew. So, that was a dive into the history of London as well as you know, env environmental issues, like, you know, what he was saying about those wildfires, which I would not have expected that in London, y'all get hot. That's like something you hear happen in like Florida or Texas or Arizona or something. Uh, I've, I've, I didn't know that about London, that they, <laughs> whew, that's, that's no joke. The heat is no joke at all. But uh, I wonder if it's like really humid out there too. Man, I was actually just talking to one of my clients, her husband, and he was talking about how London is like New York It's as far as it's endless. It's just so big. And I don't know why in my mind I always thought London was a smaller city. I'm not sure why I always thought that, but no, not at all. It's very big. Very, very big. Uh, no wonder why it's so much stuff that be just booming out of there. Like I know they had the whole grime culture with uh, music and just they had a they had a lot of they had their stuff you know they had a lot going on and they still do you know shout out to london london is definitely a city that i've always personally wanted to visit but just hearing that history and hearing um how they would have blue blueprint for other cities and just them being such a superpower is just whew, that's some serious history right there whew. but with that being said that was london the empire mega city Original link in the description, and I'll be back with more soon. Much love, y'all, and y'all stay, y'all stay cool this summer. Let me let me say that before I get out of here. Y'all stay cool because I don't know the heat. Like I'm I'm a fall time autumn guy. That's my favorite season. I do appreciate all seasons though, but I didn't know that it was that severe to where like there's wildfires that happened in London. So after learning that. Y'all definitely make sure y'all drinking y'all water and doing everything y'all can to keep them, you know, just stay cool. Because being in a large, that's, that's similar to like, it reminds me of LA. You know, like just, now I can't get it out of my mind. Like seeing that spread outness, just like LA. So y'all getting that LA weather 
That's for sure. The only difference is ain't no palm trees in London, you know. So being in a big city like that, that hot can't be can't be the most fun thing in the world, especially being on those train systems, you know, in a in a, in a subway in the summer and it's jam packed. Mm, mm -mm. That used to be the worst in New York City. So uh, with that being said, I'll see y'all soon. Much love.